get by It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See lights like a peach If you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs like the founders of RX Bars, P90X, Atari, and many more, how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Uh, our sponsor today is Rise25, which I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran. Rise25 hosts in-person VIP events and masterminds for top entrepreneurs all over the country, including many in the e-commerce industry. And Rise25 hosted events this past year in Austin, Chicago, Santa Barbara, San Diego, New York, Sonoma, Las Vegas, and probably others I'm missing. Uh, so if you see the value of immersing yourself with other top entrepreneurs to connect and collaborate, to get your business to the next level, contact us, see where our next event is going to be at rise25.com. I'm going to intro you to today's guest, Dylan. Dylan, you were actually at one of our uh, events in San Diego. Yeah. It, happened. it was fantastic um, and uh, economically fruitful. That is, you know, <laughs> buy your pillars of acquisition, conversion, retention. We'll get into that. That's important to you. So I'm glad. I'm glad you loved it. It was great to have you there and contribute. Um, so today we have Dylan Whitman, co-founder of BDXL. Full name is Brand Value Accelerator. They're one of the fastest growing Shopify focused agencies in the world. Acquisition plus conversion plus retention is are there three pillars for their e-commerce philosophy? So when you when you go to their site, you actually see that front and center. And when I saw that, Dylan, I was like, "This is my kind of company." Okay. Yeah. They provide disruptive e-commerce strategy and implementation, and they've served high-growth brands including Movement Watches, Red Bull, Mizzet Maine, Barkthins, and many, many more. Uh, BVXL is headquartered in San Diego, California with offices in New York, Los Angeles, Columbus, Mexico, and Melbourne, Australia. Correct. Dylan, thanks for joining me. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. I'm really excited. For what do you do? How do you help like a watch company with retention? So what we try to think about is, let me give you an example of retention that people might think not think of and what how it goes with conversion. So yeah. let's, let me give you an example of Copari, if you don't mind. Yeah. You've got someone that bought, think about Nosco even from a retention standpoint. Retention is, is equally about sh you leveraging previous data to show people more things that they'll want to buy and not just getting them to buy the same thing again. And I think a lot of people don't think about that in that context, right? So from a retention standpoint, it might be leveraging both on Copari and Movement, a dynamic yield, uh, dynamic yields a, a, a optimization platform that we use. It does predictive kind of uh, merchandising and whatnot or optimizations. So maybe we want to look at what's their previous buying history and merchandise the site with the thing that's most likely to be the next thing they would want. So that not only, but we're leveraging that previous customer data, right? So not only are they kind of converting, we're helping them retain that customer uh, by doing that. The other things we do are uh, outbound kind of retargeting campaigns that are based, we don't do that with, with movement because they do that in house, but outbound retargeting campaigns that are designed to bring people back and get them to purchase again, right? Things of that nature. What we don't do, we don't do the traditional email marketing and things of that nature. Um, but what we do is try to say, when people come back, how are we getting them to buy again? How do we show them something new and interesting based on what they bought? Before? Does that make sense? Yeah, for sure. So from the, the it sounds like movement, um, the conversion retention are big. They uh, you do some acquisition stuff, but they have a lot of in-house team. Um, yep. And it sounds like with Kopari, you do do some acquisition stuff. You help them with acquisition and conversion and retention. Talk about that. What um, will be the best example for from an acquisition standpoint or from the sites? Sure. So uh, from Kopari or from just like as an example, one of our clients for, for acquisition is Mizzen and Maine. So we worked with Mizzen and Maine for a long time, helping them to uh, acquire new People customers. love their stuff. Love their, dude, so good. The product <laughs> is so good. Um, and uh, we've ran advertising for them to help them acquire new customers, right? I guess the thing is, the thing that we try to do is say, here's our suite of what we do. Right. And there's some clients, even ones I'm not, we have 150 clients now, so I'm not totally 
as in the weeds on them all as I used to be. But overall, the way that we look at that is we look and say, um, what's your overall capabilities internally? Yeah. And how can we augment that in an a la carte way to help you get the full kind of suite of, of things you need to execute upon? So some of them will be affiliate and web design and development. Some will be just media buying. Some will be... See, I blog. would imagine, Dylan, people come to you and they don't even realize you do this stuff. They have this vision of what you do, which is different from what you actually do. Sure. And then when they approach you, then they probably are like, "What you do all that, right? Yep. So what kind yep. of stuff do you do under the acquisition, the conversion, and the retention? Okay. Acquisition. We run affiliate marketing campaigns. We run paid social campaigns. We run paid search campaigns. Um, and we actually have a team now that's focused on acquiring customers on Amazon. Uh, because that's that's a uh, table stakes now. Um, on conversion, we're doing personalization. We're doing uh, data driven web design and development, um, and we're doing uh, kind of road mapping and priorities and, and and strategy from that standpoint. From the retention standpoint, it's more about how can we at, with Copari, how can we work with. Uh, outside of the things I talked about, like specialized retargeting and merchandising on a site for retention, how can we also work closely with their email service provider? So Kapari works with email aptitude. So how can we work with email aptitude to make sure that their retention email or, or the product there is in line with what the, the merchandising experience is on the site when they click through from that email, right? But we look at it and say, those are the three pillars of things. We have a multitude of services within them. But we want to work with you holistically and strategically, even if you're executing some portions of that, to make sure that it's integrated across those things. The more that you can be integrated and personalized across those, I think the better. Who's a good um, client for you? Like, I'm thinking maybe someone's like, well, maybe I'm too small for BVXL because they do bigger brands. What's the kind of the entry point where it makes sense for them to engage you in one of these aspects or all of them? I would say you know, at the very low end, eight to 10,000 a month on a retainer fee. Um, on the high end, we have people paying 50,000, 60,000 a month. So it, it, it really varies. But eight to 10,000 a month, typically our clients are fast growth companies doing a couple million dollars a year. So they've grown really fast and they just wanna accelerate on it. Um, or they're larger companies who have substantial revenues that want to continue to further increase them, right? Typically a couple million a year or well-funded. We've worked with a lot of people who were D2C brands who went out and raised a bunch of money and they're able to come work with us. Um, and really, that again, it goes back to those things I was talking about, which is, you know, we made it, we are not the best agency for everyone. We made a decision that we wanted to have the best talent and that's not cheap. Um, we wanted to put in the right amount of effort and we want to find people that want to invest in really doing those things right. And that doesn't mean that a different approach is wrong, but if you do think that approach is right, we want to do it right. We don't want to dip our toe in. Does that make sense? Totally. Other things that make a, a great client for me are um, pays their bills on time. Uh, um, that's critical. Uh, I know it sounds silly almost, but seriously, I don't think people realize the impact that paying your vendors on time creates in your relationship. Because when you're a great client that's paying your bills on time, everybody notices that, sees that. It doesn't put stress on the team where they're having to go to bat for you and say, let's keep working for them, or, you know what I mean? So pay your bills on time. And then the third thing is um, that they, eat, they have to work within our process. So one of the things that I think has allowed BB Excel to scale, uh, it has been critical to it, is that we have a really um, defined project management and account strategy process that we go through. And where we find challenges is when people refuse to go through the process. They want to be special. They want to have their own things. What people don't realize is that when you don't go through the process, you create a ton of extra inefficiency in your project. It causes overburns. It causes you to not get the things that you want out of it. It causes frustrations on the part of the teams. And so we've had to fire clients because they're not able to follow the process. Who should be using you that's not? Like as you like you said, kind of going to the next level yeah. and now 
I don't know if the term punching above your weight class really holds true, but you're a smaller fish, right? Mm -hmm. Who Who's in that tier that should be using you? The funny thing, though, FYI, is those fish are now trying to jump on the Shopify Plus pond, right? But the interesting thing about that is that we've now developed the pedigree within that. So even when we compete against a lot of those guys, we still win the project. You have an expertise there. We have the expertise, and these guys are trying to learn on these people's dimes. And yes, they're a great, successful agency that's deployed Magento and Demandware instances successfully, but a lot of them really struggle with Shopify. And they struggle for a couple of reasons. Number one, it's a completely different architecture and system and way of doing things, right? So not only is there a different coding language, but it's a whole different logic kind of around how you do things. And that's challenging. We've done it so many times with so many large use cases that we are the we are the best choice for a large enterprise brand migrating to Shopify. Hands down, I believe. Um, and I think that's why we win most of those contracts. We, win. we have the most experience, not at the most amount of time. We're going to get the most predictions. I think that the people that should be using me and aren't are, are really along the same lines of the people that are using Gento and should be using Shopify. Plus, if you are a large brand, and you are spending most of your monthly retainer on maintenance and not growing revenues, and you don't have some kind of crazy use case of international B2B with some, you know, when I, I could look down the list of demandware clients and uh, Magento clients, and I can see so many people that would be saving hundreds of thousands of dollars a year on their Shopify store versus their Magento or demandware or something like Magento Enterprise. It's so much money. On so why is it stopping them? Is it just a fear of unknown? Different things. Number one is that a lot of people at these larger companies have moved up within a culture that has had to solve a different problem. Like I was saying earlier, traditional retail enterprise, because you didn't have these platforms like Shopify, was about a high fixed cost, building an investment and leveraging that to build a moat. So you're going to go in and you're going to say, I want to build the most custom, awesome, here's what I think, and here's what I think is going to be the best, and I have to do it this way because if I get this wrong, I'm fucked, right? Because uh, it's too expensive to change it, right? And there's this mindset that that's the way you have to do these really expensive builds. It's just starting yeah. to shift, but that's a cultural thing where people came up from. Yeah. On the, in, a, in addition to that, you've got a ton of legacy Magento and Demandware agencies that are scared shitless about the proliferation of Shopify and what that means to their business. Even the ones that are partnering and are out there, I know that they're scared of it because here's the problem. A Shopify build, even at the expensive end of our side, is substantially less expensive than a demand where Let me give you an example. We had a build that we did that was about 250,000 on Shopify Plus. So they had, and their retainer is, you know, $3,000 or $30,000 a month, let's call it. They're, and that's all going into actually impacting the front end and making demonstrable changes and revenue cha and experience, right? Their last build on Magento Enterprise was a million dollars and they were paying a $70,000 a month retainer. Wow. They're getting more work product for a fraction of the cost from us at a faster speed where they're able to try out new things much faster because they integrate so efficiently at a fraction of the cost. And they can take that cost and they can put it into acquiring customers. Love it, Dylan. Dylan, first of all, I just want to thank you. This has been fantastic. And I can talk to you all day. Like when you said, oh, well, I have dinner at 7, I would take you up on that. And we would just talk and break down every single site that you've worked on <laughs> and, and the acquisition conversion retention because I love this stuff and I love talking to you. And I had so many questions about you know, shifting from Shopify to Shopify Plus, you know, Magento to Shopify, mistakes, luck, hiring, all this stuff. But... I'm gonna let you relax because you just got married, and <laughs> um, I just want to end with. First of all, people should check out BV Excel, B V A C C E L dot com. They have an active blog. You can see what they've done. They've done some amazing work, um, and it's all about you know affecting the bottom line essentially. And um, so I always ask with Inspired Insider, what's been the low point? And then on the flip side, what's been a proud moment for you? Because we've heard this crazy up and down roller coaster mm -hmm. journey. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I mean, the low point was uh, uh, definitely, uh, you know, the Subway sandwiches and sleeping under my desk was, uh, and when we were down to that 80 cents and it was like a choice of this is fucking happening and there's no one else in the world that's doing it but me. So I got to figure it out or I'm done and I'm about to have to tell my friends and family in a couple weeks that I'm a loser and also owe a bunch of people payroll that, you know, aren't going to get paid. And that's my reputation. That was, that was the lowest point probably. Um, the, it's funny. I don't know if it's the highest point, but it's a, a particular moment that stood out to me um, as something that was like, just such an excitement for me. But, you know, when we land big clients now, I still get excited. I'm always excited. Like I love it. Right. But landing your first big client is you're elated. And I remember we had been pitching a deal for uh, Red Bull to build their Shopify store. And this is one of our first early stores. And we'd been pitching it for a couple months and I wanted it so bad, so bad. Uh, by the way, we were pitching against John Poma. Um, oh, really? Wanted, yeah, I knew he wanted If you, it. If you can't beat him, buy him. No. <laughs> but we, I, uh, I remember I went to go get a slice of pizza and I walked downstairs and I got about halfway to the pizza place and I got a call from the gal at Red Bull that said, hey, we're ready to move forward. And I, and by the way, this was right around the time when we had serious economic challenges, right? And that was one of the deals that helped us really get through that. Um, and I remember running back to the office as fast. We only had like eight employees then or something like that. But I remember running back to the office as fast as I can and opening the door and be like, we got Red Bull. And I was so pumped. And that that's a hard moment to recreate because even though we've got more substantial visible projects now that are much bigger and that was a, a relatively small project. It was project, the timing though. The timing, it was the timing and it was like, shit, a real brand that could work with whoever they want has decided to pay us money to help them. Like we're on to something, like we're doing this. We're on to something. And that was a big confidence boost. Yeah. Well, congrats, Dylan. Everyone check out bvxl.com and uh, check them out. Thank you. Thanks. Have a good one. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire. Came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.